All right, so um, what is a nuclei? Is it a collection of axons, a collection of neuronal cell bodies, a type of neuron, a type of glial cell? Let it be a collection of neuronal cell bodies. Um, and the reason I put that settle down up there, um, throughout this chapter they used like a lot of vocabulary like that, like nuclei, ganglion. Um, so to make sure you know what they're talking about. And which part of the brain is most superior? Is it brainstem, cerebellum, cerebrum, or dyencephalon? What's on top? It is the cerebrum. Let's see there. Um, why they have to make it so confusing? I don't know. Cerebellum's like down here on the bottom. Um, and you get to see all these things when we're going to dissect some sheep brains on Monday. So hopefully it'll kind of clear it up a little bit. They're so squishy and fun. They look like little shrimp, or big shrimp, I should say. They do. They look like big shrimp. I don't know. Or crawfish, maybe, is more accurate. Um, and which of these is not part of the brain stem? Pons, midbrain, cerebellum, or medulla oblongata? The cerebellum is not. Those other three are. Pons, midbrain, and medulla are the main parts. Um, not a function of the hypothalamus. Store memories is not a function. Um, so you might know what parts that stores your memories or helps with it. Um, so it's the, uh, the cerebrum, and then it's also the hippocampus. Um, that, you didn't have to know that from before. And main artery that supplies bread to the brain, aorta, carotid, femoral, or subclavian. It's the carotid there. Yeah. Um, yeah, your neurons can only handle about four minutes with no oxygen or glucose before they're dead. Uh -oh. uh -huh. I mean, maybe it was connected. It's pretty hard to survive if your spine gets broken in your neck, because then you're not sending impulses to your diaphragm, to your heart. I mean, that's pretty crazy. All right, um, so we just got a few things to do from um, 13. And the first one is actually kind of interesting. So if you look at different sections of the spinal cord, um, what do you see that's different between cervical, thoracic, and lumbar there? The what? Um, Which one has more, would you say they have the same amount of gray and white? No. Which one has more gray on there? Um, so if you notice, I modified this slide a little bit because technically the lumbar is the bottom of your spinal cord. So I'm not sure why that image actually has things below it. It's not quite accurate, so that's why I kind of deleted them. Um, and if you remember, what's, what's the order going from superior to inferior? of the vertebrae. So it's up there in order, right? So you're going down from the head, going down, down, down. Um, so any guesses why the lumbar has more gray than the thoracic? You may have to think a little bit about what, uh, what gray versus white is about.
right, final vote. All right, so mostly people switch to um, E there, which is correct. Nice work. Um, so of course, gray matter is where the synapses are. Um, and the reason there's more synapses is because you've got all the information coming from your lower limbs and going to those legs um, that needs to be integrated there. Whereas up here, you know, higher up, you just got the arms, but then you have all the white matter, which is carrying all the axons from everything below. So that's why as you go up, you have less and less gray and more and more white. because it's more of the axons, more of those tracks going through. Um, does that kind of make sense? I mean, clearly it sort of did because three quarters of you got to E. Um, and there's a slight mistake on the study guide there. So. These are the two we're trying to compare. On the study guide, it says, explain why the cervical has more than the thoracic. Um, it should say, why does the lumbar have more than the thoracic? And I'll try to remember to email you that, too. So that was um, G there. So it should say thoracic, or it should say lumbar instead of cervical. Chapter 13, G. Um, it should say lumbar instead of cervical. So cross off cervical and write lumbar. And then it makes sense. All right, and then the other part we didn't get to, um, is this getting darker or is that just me? <laughs> oh, maybe we have too many lights on. All right, um, so just to let you know, a plexus is like an interconnected network of nerves that goes to one part of the body. So it comes out of the spinal cord, usually it's a few vertebrae together. Um, and it is a mixed nerve. In the interest of time, um, all the answers are on here in terms of where they go. But I don't think you need me to tell you them. We've got a slide for each one. It tells you where those plexuses go to. Because we need to get to 14, the old brain. Um, before we get started, though, I've gotten some questions about grades, drop date, yada, yada. Um, drop date is coming up. I can't remember what day it is. I may remember 22nd or something. It's next week. Um, if you are considering it or something, you should come talk to me first just to make sure that you're not doing, like, there's no chance for you or something. Um, because still lots of grades to get. Got a test, got a, lab, a couple lab practicals, um, and I do replace your worst exam grade with your final grade, your final exam grade. Um, so, for example, if you got a 40% on your first test and that's really bringing your grade down, maybe you're going to get a 70 on the final and it'll replace that 40. Um, <laughs> then we uh, then we replace your best test with your final exam grade. I'm just joking. No, nothing would happen. That would be so mean, wouldn't it? You're like, oh, there goes your 100. We're changing it to an 80. Sorry about that. Um, so if you add up all that stuff, you've still got, I think, like 35 to 40% of your grade to earn right now. Um, so you can do that whenever with 
Yeah, within reason. Obviously, there's 20, how many people are in here, right? 23 people in here. Um, so you should probably start doing it if you want to, because we can't have 23 people doing it in the last day. It's, it's for one percentage point. So if you're at an 88 right now, now you're at an 89. 70. Something to do with the body. Could be diseases, could be anything. Um, and if you haven't seen it, there's information on D2L. It says extra credit assignment under general course material. You don't have to tell me in advance. It's just coming in before class or before lab. Say, hey, I got my extra credit. And then you'll just tell us about it. So there's a little worksheet for you to fill out. You'll just read your answers to that. Less than five minutes. And five minutes when you're in front of people feels like one minute. No. I don't know. <laughs> you can just talk to the ceiling. Um, and also, um, if you are struggling, what's really helped people is to come by with their um, study guides. It's so like bring by what you're studying so I can kind of look over it and make sure you're got the right answers, you're not writing too much or too little. Um, I can, I'm not going to come like stalk you and demand to see it. But if you ask for help, I can help you. A lot of people have done it. It's very helpful. Um, any other random questions about grade stuff, class stuff? If you have a lab practical on Monday, Um, so study guides I put up yesterday, so things to look over there. Don't forget. All right, so um, interesting thing about, um, actually, hold on. Let me do this question first. All right, so how many synapses do you think they are, there are in the brain? So how many neuron-to-neuron -neuron connections are there? All right, um, and as you know, you always choose the biggest number on these questions, right? And you'd be right, it is E. Um, so there's 150 trillion connections between nerves in your brain, estimated. I mean, no one really knows exactly, but that's the, the current estimate. Um, so that's a pretty staggeringly huge number. Um, and the reason I have this on here is because the brain's obviously very, very complicated, um, and we're really just beginning to understand how it all works. So for example, sure, we can tell you that this part of your brain does this. Um, so you might know how we know that. Like this part of your brain helps you make speech. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they can like zap it and trigger it. Um, so that's one way. Also, just from people that had brain damage, so you could see like this part got damaged and now they can't do this. Right? That's kind of how it all, or a lot of it came from. Um, and then now that we have more technology though, have you ever seen those brain scans where things like light up red and green? Um, so you might know how those work. Um, so that's actually a measure of blood flow. And whenever you're using a part of your brain, what do you think it needs? It needs glucose, it needs oxygen, so it sends more blood there. Um, so that's why we really learned a lot about what they do. But in terms of, you know, how is a memory stored in neurons? No one knows how that works. Like how, I mean, think about all the things you could remember. It's not like you've got like a tape in there, or the things you don't remember, or the things you don't know you remember, but are really there. It's pretty crazy. 
Um, so anyways, we're keeping it mostly simple, and that's just because we're not a neurobiology class. And even if I wanted to, we don't know how a lot of it works. All right, so start off with a little brainstorm question for your group. Just give you like a couple minutes there, it's number one. All right, so uh, see what we can get um, all together as a class. So what about structure? Like where, what's the difference between the structure of gray and white matter? So white matter is just axons and gray matter has no bodies, dendrites, axon terminals, and the synapses. So that's the structural difference. Um, those were easier. So if you're thinking about the brain itself, what do you think is different about what's happening in the white areas versus the gray areas? Do I? Okay, so like the white's just like signals traveling basically between one place to another. Um, what's happening in the gray areas then? It's like integration, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So like um, to simplify that, I would probably just say decisions are made. Basically. You mean, so um, when you see our brain dissection, there's like different parts, different areas that are gray versus white. And so maybe you have a gray area that does um, like speech recognition. And then there's another gray area that like processes it some other way or it's connected to memories. And so they'd send it from this gray area through the white part to this other gray area. I've never even heard of that. Yeah. Okay. Is that in like her brain and her spinal cord then? Or? Huh. I'll look that up. Yeah, so that means she's like losing synapses. And... Oh, wow. That sounds pretty uh, horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll have to Google that one and see what what that's about. Um, and yeah, probably one of the worst things about the brain, um, what are some brain diseases you know about? So like Alzheimer's, any other one? Yeah, ADHD, um, that would be one, schizophrenia. Um, so they're like the hardest ones to treat, right? Mostly because we don't know how the brain works. Um, partially. Um, Parkinson's. Um, and then there's a lot that like affect like the nerves and the periphery too. Um, but yeah, brain diseases are not all that easy to fix. Like that Zika virus causing all those birth defects. Like they don't, they can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean the virus causing the microencephaly, um, which is small head and brain de brain um, abnormalities. And they don't know what to do about it, except tell people don't get pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what's yeah, what's really scary is it's probably coming to the southern U.S. like this summer or next summer. It's going to be really crazy. It's concerning. Well, just don't go to the southern U.S. if you're going to get pregnant. All right. So, anyways. Um, we aren't going to spend too much time on the structure just because we'll do that in lab instead. 
when we actually look at our brain instead of just pictures. Um, but just wanted to point out a little bit, brain stems down here. So the spinal cord comes up, comes to the brain stem. Um, the cerebellum is right there. The cerebrum is up top. Um, and this, anybody know what this part is? It's that little comma or whatever. It is a ventricle, yeah. So that's like where you have a bunch of fluid to absorb shock and everything. Um, so you've got quite a few ventricles, and that is one. I just noticed that on this diagram, they didn't label it, which makes it confusing. You're like, what part of the brain is that? It's not labeled. That's because it's just fluid. But they could have labeled it for you, I think. All right. Um, obviously, your brain's probably the most important part of your body, so it needs to be pretty protected from damage. Um, and very similar to the, how you protect the spinal cord, you've got, obviously, the bones around it, your skull, and then inside the skull, you have a series of membranes called the meninges, just like the spinal cord. Um, and it's the pia, arachnoid, and the dura matter. So, the word meningitis, meningitis? Yeah, so meningitis is when you get bacteria growing um, and you get inflammation within those layers somewhere, which leads to fluid buildup, pressure on the brain. Um, my understanding is it could be any of those. Definitely don't want bacteria growing in there. All right. Um, so if you took a little, little section Oh, and of course, how do they diagnose meningitis? So, yeah, so it should be clear. If it's cloudy, it means there's lots of white blood cells in there, um, which indicates there's an infection. Um, so moving in, you've got the bone on the outside, then dura, arachnoid, and pia matter. So just all different membranes. Make sure you're not letting anything in there. Do you need something? I'm just waiting for the next question to come up. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Um, so I realize it might be interesting to look at like an actual human brain in there. Um, so this one was sliced open. There's all the skull. Um, and the dura matter is really close to the, like it's um, more like a balloon around. So it's kind of pressed up against the bone. And then the pia matter, you know, the most innermost, really is like shrink wrapped the nervous tissue itself. Um, unfortunately, our brains don't have, our, our brain, our sheep brains um, don't have the meninges on them anymore. So I don't get to see that. All right, and then you've got um, all that cerebrospinal fluid in there and main functions. Um, the first one is probably protection against physical injury. So obviously, even when you're just moving around normally, do you think your brain's kind of moving too? It's like if you walk and you stop, and, you know, head a soccer ball or something. Um, the brain's not really like screwed down with cords or something. Instead, you just fill the interior and also those meninges around them. There's fluid, so that, that fluid can absorb the shock, and so the brain doesn't get damaged. Um, you might know what a concussion is in terms of this. What is it? Yeah, it's when your brain like you know accelerates too much and then bangs against the skull basically. So this fluid can only protect you against so much brain movement. Um, no, that'd be a good um, guess. Your equilibrium is actually um, nerves in your inner ear. Um, would make sense to do it that way, but they don't. Um, and it also provides a way for nutrients to diffuse and waste to diffuse out of the nerve cells and into the blood. Anybody know how what percentage of your oxygen and glucose is used by the brain? Any guesses? Uh, 
Um, so it's actually 20%. Um, so it takes, it takes a lot of inner, lot of ATP to keep all those neurons working and alive. All right, so which of these is not a function of the cerebrospinal fluid? I'll come to John. All right, um, so most people chose E there. I'm going to go ahead and tell you to talk to a group and that E is not the answer. So you're going to have to choose one of those. Final votes. <laughs> All right, so we got B there, um, and you're right. It's not one of its functions. Um, for the most part, there aren't really any cells in the fluid at all. There's no red blood cells, there's no white blood cells. Does it predict so that's why that's oh, um, I wouldn't worry about the chemical injury part. It's a little complicated. That's just what I got. Yeah. No, I get it. Um, so really just shock absorption and then exchange of nutrients and waste, like oxygen, glucose, everything like that. Um, I think protection against chemical injuries is a lot more blood-brain barrier than anything else. <laughs> All right, so the most confusing thing about um, the blood-brain barrier is that, first off, do you, have, um, do you have blood in your brain? You do? Um, is it just in one place, or is it like spread Everywhere. everywhere. Hopefully it's everywhere, so all your neurons are getting. <laughs> um, but the blood-brain barrier, um, so you've got all those blood vessels, all those capillaries all throughout, and between the capillaries and the brain cells themselves, like the neurons and the glial cells, um, there's a very selective um, barrier that doesn't let too many things through. Mm -hmm. Right? Definitely. Um, and that's because, that's actually on the next slide, but, um, but yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. But what is it made of? Um, it's got a few different layers. So uh, there's the capillaries. Um, so the capillary walls have tight junctions between them. Remember tight junctions, what do they stop the movement of? Way back to chapter four. It is water, they are watertight. Um, so that means anything that's water or smaller can't get between the cells, which is good. Um, and then outside of that is a basement membrane, you know, like that connective tissue, it's very thick. Um, and then outside of that, so like moving out from capillary to more like the nervous system side. Um, there's those astrocytes. Remember those were a type of glial cells that kind of regulate the environment. So they wrap the capillaries in their paravascular feet, which we'll see in this picture. Um, so here's an astrocyte, one cell, and you see it kind of has all these feet that come out and wrap around the capillary, which means anything that's going to get to your neurons 
has to go through all three of those layers. So for example, if there's something really toxic in the blood, who do you think's gonna get killed first? The neuron or something else? <coughs> this, uh, this tough little green cell here, that astrocyte. Um, it would base, it's like a bodyguard. So there's something nasty in the blood, astrocyte absorbs it, kills that cell, but then maybe it's not able to kill the neuron. And these are the types of cells that can be replaced. So there's a little, little bodyguards in there. All right, so if obviously there's lots of things that do cross that barrier. Um, what order does it go in? And we are starting like in the blood, going outwards. So, so. All right, so most people chose B. Um, that would actually be incorrect. Um, it is C. <laughs> That's the order. So for something to go from the blood to the neuron, has to go past the epithelial cells, past the basement membrane, and through the astrocyte feet. Um, so most things can't cross. Um, for example, antibiotics, for the most part, they can't cross. Um, most proteins cannot. Really, anything that's um, hydrophilic cannot. So that includes important things like glucose. Glucose can't cross easily, so instead there's special active transport channels that'll take the glucose from the blood and pump it out into the, um, by the neurons. But things that are lipid soluble or Hydrophobic, like oxygen, um, alcohol, nicotine, anesthetics, any drug that does something to your brain is probably hydrophobic, otherwise it wouldn't be getting in there. Um, interesting. All right, so which of these is not a true statement about that barrier? Not true, not true. So which is false? All right. Um, so the winning vote right now is B, um, and you would be correct if you chose B. It's not gap junctions. Remember, gap junctions are like big holes. It's the last thing you would want. You want tight junctions. That's what you want. Um, so before we go on, just so reminder, don't get the meninges confused with the blood-brain barrier, right? The meninges are just on the outside, kind of protecting the whole brain. The blood-brain barrier is everywhere that there's blood vessels, which is everywhere in the, in the brain, basically. All right. Uh, let's do this one first. Right. Make sure I do the right ones on here. Oh. 
All right, so just wanted to show you a little bit about where everything is up there before we get into all the dissection. Um, first, starting at the top, there's your cerebrum, and we'll talk more about that later. Obviously, that's the largest part of your brain. Um, that's where your consciousness is, for one thing. Like That's where all your conscious thoughts, conscious feelings, sensory feelings, not just emotional feelings. Um, anything you think is coming from there. Um, and we've got cerebellum down there. There's the pituitary gland, which we'll talk about in bio 202. And then the brainstem, you've got the medulla, the pons, the midbrain, and then the hypothalamus, the thalamus. Um, I guess they don't have the epithalamus. It's this little thing right, right there. So let's talk about what each of those do. Um, first up is our midbrain. So remember that was kind of in the middle of the brainstem. So I think of the midbrain as like a relay station. So it takes motor impulses from the cerebrum up top and the cerebellum um, and then sends it off you know, down farther or maybe it goes from sensory impulses from the spinal cord to the thalamus. So mostly it just takes in information from one place and sends it on to another. Um, the only sort of decisions it makes are your auditory and visual reflexes. So if somebody like claps behind you and you like jump or something, that's your midbrain that did that. Um, same thing with your visual reflexes. Do we know any visual reflexes? Um, I don't know if that's one or not. Yeah, um, no, I know that's a reflex, but I'm not entirely sure if that's midbrain or not. I suspect it might be something else. Definitely like the pupil dilation is. Um, so like, you know, more light leads to dilate or constricted pupils, less light. Um, and we'll be testing that in the lab later. So that'll be the main one. All right, um, what does the medulla oblongata do? Lots of stuff, lots and lots of reflexes. So it gets to do your vomiting reflex, which as you know, vomiting isn't voluntary, All right? No matter what, you can try not to, but it is involuntary and the medulla is in charge. Um, sneezing, swallowing, and it has a big role in regulating your heart and respiration rate. Um, it doesn't directly, you know, control it. Um, never mind, ignore that. It helps control your cardiac and respiratory rate. And in 202, when we go, when we do respiratory and cardiac system, talk more about that. Have a little video about it as well. First, we get to watch an ad. No, it's um all the systems we haven't learned about. Yeah, so respiratory, digestive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should tell you that if you are taking two hundred two, you don't need a new book. Um, it's also the same lab book too. So. Don't go buy a new book or something. Be, you'd be really upset when you got it in the mail and you realized it was the same one. That seems like something I would do, you know, like not pay attention, end up with. All right. All right, so how about our video of that from the medulla? <laughs> This is me in the future. Yeah. 
can't see us. It's my favorite part of the brain because of this. Right. So, favorite part of the braid, um, which is funny, was was what Colonel Sanders said actually right about what the Mandula Blancada does. <laughs> it's not even right. Um, it's actually the amygdala who does that. One of our next ones, which obviously I didn't know when I saw that movie until I was teaching about the brain. I was like, wait a second. I know. See, you probably, how many people have seen that movie? Most of y'all probably. Did you know it was wrong? <laughs> I know, for years. I mean, I thought that for years. Like, I was, you know, why would they have it wrong? Well, anyway. Anyways. What if that is me in the future? Wait, not that one. All right, so moving on to some more parts of the brain. Um, the amygdala is where the emotions come from. So fear, strong emotions. Um, and the hippocampus, that's where it helps in storing memories and forming long-term <coughs> memories. Um, interestingly enough, the, um, you all have heard of lobotomies and seen that in movies before, right, at some point. Um, Way, way back, maybe it used to be really you're taking off, taking out a bunch of the brain, but the ones you probably saw in like the 50s, they actually just severed the connection between the amygdala and the cerebrum. Well, they also do like, you know, the electroshock stuff, or used to. Um, but yeah, so a lobotomy was actually severing the connection between the amygdala and your cerebrum, so then now you don't have emotions hardly anymore. Because the emotion part is disconnected from the thinking part. Um, so yeah, I guess people that were aggressive weren't aggressive anymore, but they were also like, you know, no emotions anymore, just kind of stable. All right, um, then you've got our cerebellum. So this is a little bit behind the brainstem. And the cerebellum is basically, helps you kind of fine tune all your movements. Um, so for example, let's say you're telling your arm to do something like pick up this pin. That comes from your cerebrum, goes to the cerebellum, information comes back to the cerebellum to kind of tell you if it's, if you're close. Like is it, are you doing what you want to? Is your finger exactly, you know, spread out as much as you're telling it to? And if it's not, the cerebellum kind of adjusts it. Um, so when you're walking, you know, do you have to think really carefully about how you're walking or does it just kind of happen? So you just kind of send a signal 
from your cerebellum or from your cerebrum, you know, walk, and then your cerebellum kind of takes care of the rest. Like make sure you're balanced and all that business. And if maybe you probably wouldn't even perceive it, but if you start to lean one way or the other, the cerebellum would kind of fix your posture and make you keep walking um, straight, not falling over. All right, and then we have our thalamus, um, and it has nuclei that does relay um, for everything except smell. So your vision goes to the thalamus first. Um, all your sensory stuff like touch, hearing, goes to the thalamus first. And then from the thalamus, it's sort of integrated, kind of processed, and then sent to the cerebrum up top. So it's kind of like you, know, you have all the, the raw data coming in, and then the thalamus is like the computer that sort of sorts through it and sends it to the cerebrum where in a more intelligible form, basically. Um, you could define the cerebrum into a five main parts. So frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and insula. Um, do those first three words look familiar? So those were the bones of the skull. Um, so if you knew those bones, then you know where the lobes are, because they basically match. Um, there aren't, like once we see the brain, you'll notice there's not like some line between those lobes or anything. They pretty much just look like the whole cerebrums together, but they do kind of divide it for ease of discussion. Um, and the insula, that's kind of in the middle, so you wouldn't see it on the surface. So it's kind of in the middle of it, if that makes sense. It's a little thing. All right, so what does the cerebrum do? Um, anything you consciously think about is the cerebrum. So all your perception of the world around you from all your senses, um, any of your skeletal muscle voluntary movement, memory, personality, intelligence, really anything you can imagine. Stuff there. Um, and if you look at, you know, we talked about the imaging studies and the people with brain damage studies, there's all kinds of different locations where different things happen. We divide them into three categories sensory areas, motor areas, and association areas. Um, first two make pretty good sense. Um, so sensory areas, those are for where you send information about your senses, smell, taste, vision, touch, all that stuff. Uh, motor areas are areas where you're sending out information about moving, move your muscles, and association areas um, we're going to talk about those in a little bit. So you don't need to know, obviously, these numbers. Um, but I just want to point out, it's not like it's in one little spot. So your sensory areas are all over. One, two, and three. Um, 17 is your visual area. 28. Does anyone see 28 on there? I don't. That's weird. Um, 41 over here, that's your taste, or that's 43. Um, your hearing is right there in 42. So it's kind of all spread out throughout the cerebrum. But that little spot, if you damage this little spot, you wouldn't be able to hear anymore. Kind of interesting. Right. Um, for cochlear implants, I think that was a problem with the ear itself. And so they kind of make an artificial eardrum, and then I guess they hook it up to the nerve somehow. I don't know how they work exactly. Pretty interesting, though. Um, so perception, and then we've got our motor areas. And interestingly enough, um, four is this big area for all kind of your normal muscle movements you think of. 
And then we have two areas for speech. So you have little parts of your brain that are only for moving all the muscles for speech. Um, so what all do you move for speech? So like your tongue, your mouth, your jaw. Um, it's kind of interesting. All right, and the last one, which is actually most of the cerebrum, is your association areas. And what association areas are is things like if you close your eyes and hold something, you have a mental picture of what it is because you know, like for example, I know what a marker looks like. I don't have to look at it to see what it looks like. Um, recognize objects, recognize faces, noises know what odors are. Um, so basically a lot of your memory is there. Interpret speech as part of the association area. So sure you can have you know, the um, noises coming in, like the signals coming in to the sensory part, but if it's speech, it has to get sent over to an association area to be interpreted. And somewhere in there somehow, personality and intellect as well. All right, so question two, is there not, did I not get one for myself? Any extras? Anybody have extras in the back? Anybody, anybody? Um, so, wait, there's my answers. Um, inability to recognize faces, what letter was that? Um, so there would have been a few possible answers. Um, H works. Um, what else did y'all say? Um, hippocampus. Oh, like you couldn't make a memory of the person's face. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, possibly. So like you couldn't, you could recognize old faces, but not new ones. That'd be hippocampus, maybe. Um, and then did you say G too? So G would be like if you were blind. Then. Uh, I don't think A. That'd be that's more like with emotion. I would say B and H. Because um, I mean, if you had problems with the sensory area, it wouldn't just be faces. It'd be like lots of things with your vision wouldn't be working. Um, intense rage. I think A is the best answer. Anyone put anything else? Um, low levels of pituitary hormones. That's F. It's hypothalamus. Hypothalamus tells the pituitary to make hormones. Um, inability to speak. Um, why'd you put D? <laughs> Sensory is like sensing from outside though. Whoops. <coughs> Turn off your phone. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's unable to speak. I would put I. That's the motor area that controls like the movement of the muscles. Um, difficulty maintaining posture. That'd be C, that's cerebellum. Um, or, uh, difficulty swallowing. That's E, that's medulla. Inability to form new long-term memories. I think B is the best answer. Um, you could have put H too, probably. Blindness, um, probably G there, sensory area. Now would be, you know, when you write blindness, it just means like you really legitimately can't see anything. So you'd probably go with the sensory area. Do it. Yeah. But hypothalamus? Oh, right, because the midbrain does relay it. So yeah, it could be D, too. Could be D or, um, you're right. Um, and of course, I just um, want to remind you, any of those 
deafness, blindness. It doesn't only have to be a brain problem. It could be a problem, you know, with the eye itself or the ear, not anything like that. And difficulty understanding speech. Um, I'd go with H for that one. All right, so we'll do, uh, we'll do that last, the nerves next time. Study for your lab practical.